looking good. Hey, just very quickly, you know what happened on this day many, 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 many years ago? I want to tell you a, a story uh, about a guy. And uh, some of you may know this story, but it, it goes like this. In 1962, on New Year's Day, 1962, there was a guy, a record executive at Decca Records by the name of Dick Rowe. Anyone know where I'm going with this? Exactly. This record executive, Dick Rowe, New Year's Day, 1962, had a chance to listen to four young guys perform music. Uh, and the name of the band was the Silver Beatles at the time. They were called the Silver Beatles. And he listened to their record and made the decision that guitar music was going out, something else was coming in, and these guys would never, ever make it. Well... If you drop the silver off, it's the Beatles. They got a new drummer, and the rest is history. And I don't know if David Rowe is alive today, but if he was alive today, and I was him, every New Year's Day would be met with great sadness at the millions and millions and millions of dollars that I threw out the window because I didn't see the potential in these guys. A very, very bad, and uh, in, in time we know, a very, very unwise uh, decision that was made by David Rowe on this day, back in 1962. There you go, a little bit of history for you. So if you get nothing else out of today, you've learned a bit of history about the Beatles. Amen. Great stuff. Um, here's a little story I came across recently. There, were, there was a man who moved into a retirement community to spend the rest of his life there. And it wasn't long until he made a number of friends and people uh, met some people amongst the residents. There was one lady there that really caught his eye. Right? This lady there. Yeah, yeah. Owen, do it again. Ooh. This lady caught his eye. And he was really attracted to her, and she was actually attracted to him too. And so they spent a lot of time together. And one evening, he got down on one knee and he proposed to this woman, will you marry me? And she said, yes. Anyway, the next morning, he woke up and he remembered that he proposed, but he couldn't remember her answer. So he went walking through the retirement village, found her, said, look, I'm really embarrassed. I proposed to you last night, but I can't remember if you said yes or no. <laughs> And she said to him, thank goodness, I remembered saying yes, but I couldn't remember who asked me. <laughs> you know what? That is going to be the story for many, many people. <laughs> I didn't full stop there. I said, many, many people, you cut me off, okay? That is going to be the story for many, many people in their New Year's resolutions. They are going to make these grandiose plans to change and to do this and do that and be this and be that and so on. And as quick as you forget who, as quick as you forget the answer to the proposal, and as quick as you can forget who proposed to you, so many people will also forget the uh, uh, New Year's resolutions they made and plans that they had and the things that they were going to do differently and better. It's it's just a reality. Statistically, you know, most people make New Year's resolutions, and within two to six weeks, 95% of those resolutions are out the window. Within two to six weeks, most resolutions are gone. Nothing magical happens at the turn of a calendar. But having said that, we can't deny the fact that on the 1st of January, there is this awe and air of expectation and fresh hope and a sense of a new start and this sense of a fresh, clean slate. So whether there's power in the date change or not, there's, there's, there's something about this time of year where people open themselves up with expectation, with faith, with, with a sense that things can be different, with, a, with, with a, a newfound sense of courage and vigour to go, okay, I'm going to do this different or I'm going to tackle this or I'm going to drop that off my life or I'm going to become this or whatever. There is something about the moment. Even though the date change is nothing, there is something about it. New Year gives us a vision of a clean slate, a fresh opportunity to start all over again. It's almost like we get this chance to hit a, a reset button. Anyone got a computer and you ever hit a reset button and it just sort of goes back to, you know, because you, you get your computer or your phone and you add this app and then you add that app and sort of as time goes on, you just add this stuff and one day you look at it and you go, I don't even know why I added all that stuff. Why have I got all these? All they're doing is slowing down the running of the machine and every now and then you, you can go back and there's this thing called a factory reset. You just press a button and bang, everything goes back and it's all off your machine and it's almost like it was brand new again and there's that sense of us being able to hit a reset button uh, at this time of the year. But here's the thing. Even though it's possible for change to take place in our life and for us to get up from here and in January 2nd to, to be a very different person than we were December 31, it's got nothing to do with dates and everything to do with decisions. It's got nothing to do with dates, but it has everything to do with decisions. Here, here's a reality. I was thinking about this this week. Here's the truth. I want to ignore it. I don't want to believe it, but I have to believe it and I can't ignore it. And the truth is this. 
The place that I'm standing in in life right now is a culmination of all the choices that I have made up until this point. Not everything. Sometimes things happen to us that are totally out of our control. But we still have choices to make in the way we respond to those things, don't we? We still have the choice in how we move forward from those moments that happen in our life. But generally speaking, most of the, the things that have happened in my life, most of the places I'm standing in today, they are a direct result and consequence of the decisions that I have made that have got me to this point. If I'm unfit, it's because I made a decision to turn an alarm off, for example, and not get out of bed and go for a walk and go for a run. And then I decided the next day that, well, I won't do it then too because it's too wet. And then the next day I decided, look, I'm halfway through the week, I'll just restart again on Monday and we'll try again. And if, if I, I've got all these things, these little decisions that I've made that have got me to being the person I am, the place that I'm standing right now. I don't want to admit that, I don't want to accept that, but that is the reality. I can't change that. That the decisions I've made have largely got me to the place I am and to being the person that I am. I saw, I saw this um, meme, and I thought it was a fantastic meme um, this morning. On, on, I saw it somewhere on, online. And it said this. It said that everything happens for a reason. And sometimes the reason is because you're stupid and make bad decisions. Everything happens for a reason. And sometimes the reason is because you're stupid and you're making bad decisions. Now, how true is that? I don't know about you, but I have made some bad decisions in my life. Anyone else made a bad decision here? I just want to know that somebody's connecting to what I'm saying. Yep, so a couple of you have made a bad decision or two. Yep, anybody never made a bad decision? Anyone here, you've never made a bad decision in your life? Okay, great. So you've never, never not made a bad decision, but you didn't make a bad decision when I just asked if you'd made a bad decision. I'm so confused right now, people. You're discombobulating me all over the shop. I love that. Sometimes the reason... It's because I'm stupid and I've made some bad decisions. I was thinking about the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. We all know the story of the prodigal son. You have to turn there. But, but here's, here's kind of how he ended up one day where he was. He entertained the idea of getting his inheritance before the right time. Remember the story? He went to his dad and said, give me my inheritance now. Culturally very insensitive, very disgraceful to the father. Should have been dealt with in, in other ways. Should have had the, the uncles called in to sit him down and chat to him. Should have gone to the temple and the priest should have gabbed him and, and talked him through the law and why this was... There was a whole bunch of cultural things that should have happened. But he, here he was sitting there. He would have known all that. But he started by entertaining this, this bad uh, idea. And here's the thing. It's never wise to entertain bad ideas. Okay. Because then that bad idea turned into an action, and what did he do? Then he actually got up and went to his father and said, I want my inheritance, and I want it now. And it's never wise to act on a bad idea either, okay? And then, after he acted on that bad idea, he decided to leave his father's house and the place of accountability and protection and go off to a distant land where he didn't know anybody and could throw off the shackles of life and just feel like he could, I guess, be his version of free. Then he spent all his money on wild living. And here's the thing, he would have spent that first bit of money and had that, that, I guess, pleasure for a moment or whatever, but then looked down and probably realised, okay, that's a little bit less than I had and I got nothing back and tried again and again and again, but he kept on going and he kept on going and he kept on going and he spent everything. Then he got so destitute, he hired himself out to a pig farmer and one day he's sitting there feeding the pigs and saying to himself, geez, that food looks good. <laughs> geez, that food looks good. Now, here's the reality. He didn't just wake up one day and find himself craving pig food. It was the end result of a series of unwise decisions that he had made in his life that got him to that point. And here's how it works for too many people. This is how bad decisions work. And if you're not a Christian here, you don't follow Jesus, then I hope you get something out of this. But I'm speaking now specifically to those of us that call ourselves Christians, all right? Here's what we do. We do what we want to do. We fall into a hole. And then we try to tell God how to get us out of the hole. I'm going to go over here, God, and I'm going to do what I want to do. And when it gets messed up, I'm going to turn around to you, God, and say, now, here's what you need to do to get me out of the problem that I got myself in because I decided to do what I wanted to do. Anyone relate to that? A couple of nervous chuckles, a couple of nodded heads. I think we can all relate to that to a certain degree. And when we get ourselves in that hole, what do we do? We cry out, God, I need a miracle. God, I need a miracle. Any, anyone ever, ever relate to that? You ever get to that place where you know it's just been a series of unwise choices and so on, and you get yourself into a hole, and then you turn in desperation, and you cry out to God and say, God, I need a miracle. 
I've been there. I will probably be there again. I'm hoping I don't get there, but being human, I probably will. Uh, And we've probably all been to that place where we say, God, I need a miracle. But here's a thought I want to give you as we begin 2023. Here's what I want you to think about at the start of 2023. What if, what if, for 2023, instead of doing things our own way first, then crying out to God for miracles? What if we cried out to God for wisdom first, then went and did things his way? Maybe we wouldn't need so many miracles in our lives. What if we all decided to make 2023 the year of living wisely? What if we drew a line in the sand and we said, God, my goal, my New Year's resolution for 2023 is I'm going to live 2023 wisely. That's my goal. God, I'm going to make wise decisions, wise choices. God, I'm going to make 2023 the year where I press in to wisdom. You see, we need miracles for the things that we can't do and we need wisdom for the things that we can do. And here's the reality, we can do a lot more than we think we can. Amen? We can do a lot more than we think we can. We can live the next 12 months depending on miracles, which are not, by the way, a guarantee from God. God doesn't guarantee you a miracle. He doesn't guarantee you miracles. I've seen miracles. I've experienced miracles. I've been in the middle of miraculous situations and things that have happened. I've prayed for people that should be dead, that were miraculously healed. I've prayed for people who went on and died. There's no promise that I'm always going to have a miracle. God has miraculously provided for me financially in ways that are unfathomable and blew my mind. Then there have been other situations where I've just had to say no to that opportunity because the money wasn't there. Well, God, why did you give me a miracle over here but not over here? I don't know why God chooses and does what he does. That's the beauty of him being God and me being human. I don't know everything, but I trust. But here's the thing I do know. Miracles are possible, but miracles are not guaranteed. And none of us are called to live by miracles. God doesn't want us to live for miracles. There's a better way. And we can spend the next 12 months depending on miracles, which are not always guaranteed. Or we can live with wisdom, which God promises to give us. James chapter 1, verse 5 to 8. If any of you lacks wisdom, anyone here in this room relate to that. if, If James was standing in front of you right now looking out here and said, if any of you lack wisdom, put your hand up. Would anyone put their hand up? I'd put both my hands up and both my feet. If I could, I'd fall over. I'd have everything sticking up towards heaven because I need wisdom. I am a father of four kids and God, I need wisdom to parent those kids. Anyone get an amen out of that one? I am a husband to a woman. God, I need wisdom. Any men here, amen that one. There are women in this room and you have husbands and guess what? You too need wisdom. Might not be the same amount as we do, but you need it. Men are probably not as complex There's safety in numbers. But we all need wisdom. Young people, you are in a world right now that is telling you that God doesn't exist, that is telling you that freedom means no boundaries. You are in a world right now that's telling you you can have what you want, when you want, because you want really quick. You are in a world that is screaming at you that you are your own God, make your own choices, that you can have all the rights that the world has to offer with zero responsibility. You need wisdom. You need wisdom to navigate that. I, I am glad that I'm not a young person going to school and growing up today. I, 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 yeah, I, I turned 50 a few months back, halfway through the year I turned 50, and when I was at school, you know what, it just was not as complicated. The stuff we were facing, things we were going through, weren't as, weren't as complex as the stuff that I see you guys. And so sometimes our older generation, we don't get you. We don't understand you, where you're coming from. We can't connect. But we actually have great compassion because... We know that you've got so much stuff going on and so many more voices screaming at you. When I was a kid, there was only one screen that we would gather around. It was called a television. And we only had three channels, you know. It was ABC, nine, ten or something. And it was boring. Nothing on there was any good except for the Friday, the football on Saturday. And I spent most of my time as a kid listening to the radio because ABC Grandstand was on. I listened to the rugby league on the radio all weekend. Now you guys have got... Twitters and Twitface and 
TikToks and all kinds of things going on around you, and everybody's screaming, and everyone tells you they're an expert and they know how it should work. Guys, you need, you need wisdom. You genuinely need the wisdom of God to make it through and to navigate and to be the best person that you can be. He says, if anyone lacks wisdom, you should ask who? God, isn't that simple? Isn't that simple? It's not complex. James, I think, is kind of just trying to dumb this here down a bit and say to a bunch of people, here's the thing. I know what you're going through. I know what you're facing. I know the circumstances that are happening around you. If you go back and you read the beginning of that chapter, he's talking about, about going through temptations and trials. And he says that you need perseverance to make it through temptations and trials. And then he goes, and the way you're going to get the perseverance to do that is you need wisdom. Because it's kind of an odd thing. You read James chapter 1, it's an odd thing. He goes on, talks about trials, the testing of your faith, needing perseverance. And then randomly in the middle of it, he says, if anyone lacks wisdom. What he's trying to say is that the only way that you're going to get through those trials and those testings is you need to develop perseverance in your life. You know why most people give up on the New Year's resolutions? They've got no perseverance. No perseverance. I'll go to the gym one week and in the second week, ah... Can't, can't persist. There's no, I, I can't persevere with this. I drop it off. I'll eat healthy, but then I drop it off. I'll, 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 I'll pray. I'll, I'm going to make sure that in the mornings this year, 2023, I'm going to get up. I'm just going to spend 15 minutes alone, quietly with the Lord. Read a Bible passage and then just pray. I'm just going to, because I, I, you know, some people don't do any time at all each day with God. We kind of, God's the one that, okay, God, you've got to keep up with me. I'm going, I'm busy, I'm doing. And yes, the Lord's with us everywhere. But there's something powerful about stopping and making him the priority and giving him some time instead of saying, you've got to follow me around like a puppy dog all day, God, and and you better keep up with me and I'll chat to you on the way. There's just something powerful about that quiet time where we just put that time aside to be with the Lord in his word and prayer. And he's talking about all this stuff going on. He says, you need perseverance. And then he says, the way that you're going to get perseverance, he says, you need wisdom. Because if you don't have wisdom... You won't be able to stand against the trials and the temptations and the testing of your faith and all this stuff. It's not going to happen. You're going to collapse. And you know what? Here's what happens. Most people, within two to to six weeks, their New Year's resolutions are over. That means that for 46 weeks of the year, they're going to be the same person they were last year. And you're going to get to the end of 365 days and look back and go, you know what? I'm exactly the same person. I'm standing in the same place 365 days later than I was 365 days ago. Why? Well, maybe we, we tried all these other ways of getting there, you know? Uh, anyone ever seen that movie, School for Scoundrels? Anyone ever seen that? I'm not, I'm not necessarily recommending because I haven't seen it for years. And you've always got to say that as a, when, when you're standing in front of a church, you've always got to say, here's a movie, but I'm not recommending it, just to cover yourself, you know? Anyway, it's got Billy Bob Thornton in it and um, John Heg- Heder or Heger, whatever. It's about a bunch of people that, that um, live on self-help books. It's just all self-help, self-help, self-help. And what they do is they, this guy uh, gets them all together in a room and he holds a class for these types of people that want self-help. And the first thing he says to them, he says, I'll bet you, uh, hands up, anyone in this room that has a bunch of self-help books, Tony Robbins, all that stuff, I'm not anti them, I'm just saying, who has all them self-help books now that near their bedside table and all, everyone in the room puts a hand up, real proud of himself. And he says, well, that's your biggest problem. Your biggest problem is you're reading self-help books, you're trying to get help from yourself, but yourself sucks. I don't have the wisdom within myself I need to be the man of God that I need to be, to be the parent I need to be, to be the husband I need to be, the pastor I need to be, to to be the member of the community. I I need wisdom beyond myself. I need a a different type of wisdom that's outside of me. And James says here, if you lack wisdom, he says, it's not hard to get it. Ask God. Ask God. How often in 2022 did you stop before you made a decision and said, Lord, I need your wisdom? God, I need you to give me wisdom on this. Before I make this decision, this choice, before I turn left, before I turn right, before I hire, before I fire, before I buy, before I don't, before I book, before whatever. God, I just, I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to ask you for wisdom. And James is making a promise here saying, if you lack wisdom, ask of God, watch this, who gives generously to all without finding fault. Isn't that a powerful thought? God is promising, you ask me for wisdom, I'm going to give it to you. Just like a father to his children. If his children want help, they come and say, Dad, I need a hand with this. What would you do? What would you say? How would you manage this? No father's going to sit there, no good father, 
is going to sit there and try to manipulate and trick. No, no, we're just going to give you the truth. Whether you like it or not, we're going to speak the truth in love to you because we want you to succeed. We want you to win. We want you to grow up and be the best that you can be. And God feels the same way for us as his kids. He wants us to be everything that we're created to be so that we can do everything that he wants us to do on this tiny speck of dust time that we have called existence, called life. I've only got X amount of years here. Eternally began way before I came on the scene. God will continue to move way past when I'm gone. But while I'm here, Lord, I just want to connect with you and do what you want me to do. I'm sure everybody in this room does. He says, God gives generously to all without finding fault. Then it will be given to you. It will be given to you. God will give you wisdom. Do you want to live on miracles or do you want to live on wisdom? I think wisdom is a better way. And I think wisdom is the way that God wants us to go. God wants us to live with wisdom. And maybe, maybe for some of us, if we spent 2023 going, God, give me wisdom, we would spend less time crying going, God, give me a miracle. Miracles are for those things that we can't change. But wisdom are for the things that we can. Sometimes we can change things before we even get there by simply being wise in the process and wise in the decisions. And he goes on in verse 6, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. In other words, God, I need wisdom. And I'm going to get up off my knees or get out of my prayer closet or get out of the car or whatever it is when I've asked for wisdom. And I'm going to move forward believing in faith that, God, you are going to give me the wisdom I need at the right time. I'm going to walk away. I'm not going to second guess. I'm going to trust that, okay, God, I've, I've asked you for wisdom. And in simple childlike faith, I'm going to trust that you will give it to me. And I'm going to go about my day and I'm going to go about, and I'm, God, I'm trusting that you will give me the wisdom that I'm asking for. He says, don't doubt. Don't doubt your father. There's not many things, there's not many promises in the Bible that I can honestly say and preach with integrity where I believe 100% you do this, God will do that. I know that there are books filled all over Kurong saying the five steps to financial prosperity and the four ways to divine healing and the three ways to divine this and that, that, that. I'm sorry, I don't see any of that kind of stuff in this collection of ancient documents. These writers must not have had the revelation that we modern people seem to have. I'm sure they would love to come back from the dead and sit under our great, wonderful teaching so we can explain to them what they meant when they wrote it. But this one's a guaranteed promise. James is saying, here's how it is. Your father loves you. And he wants you to be who you're meant to be. And he wants you to do the things that you're called to do, that you were placed here for. And there's going to be trials, temptations, and testings along the way that are going to try to pull you away from that, slow you down, and stop you. But here's the thing. You're going to need wisdom to get through that. And here's how you get wisdom. I want you to ask the father. I want you to ask God, and I want you to believe when you ask him that he's a good God. He's going to give you that wisdom. When them trials and testings and all that stuff come, you are going to be able to go through them because you'll have the perseverance that is the fruit of wisdom. You'll have the perseverance that is the fruit of godly, godly wisdom. James chapter 3, verse 13 to 18. James continues on talking a bit about wisdom. Here's what he says. He said, Who is wise and understanding among you? He says, Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbour bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. And he gives us this picture of there's two types of wisdom. And he says, such wisdom, in verse 15, such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it's earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. He says, there's a wisdom out there in the world, and it's earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. And, and what does that wisdom produce? Well, he says, it produces selfish ambitions. It produces envy. It produces disorder. It produces evil actions. So there's a wisdom out there that you can try to tap into. And I guess we could potentially say it's the spirit of the age. It's worldly wisdom. And he says this kind of wisdom is not necessarily going to bring into your life the fruits that God wants to bring into your life and the stuff that God wants to bring into your life. So he says there's this kind of wisdom, earthly, unspiritual, demonic. He says, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. So he says there's this earthly, unspiritual, demonic wisdom, but he says there's also a heavenly wisdom. There's a heavenly wisdom that God wants to give to his children. In fact, Jesus told us a parable. 
He told a parable to a crowd one day, and it actually reveals where this wisdom primarily comes from. And we all know the story of the wise and foolish builder. Matthew 7, 24, the first part of that story, he says this. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a what? Wise man. So here you've got a man, and he's saying, this man here is wise. What made this man wise? Well, he heard what God had to say, and he did it. He actually heard what God had to say, and he did what God had to say, and that's what made him wise. So we, a wise person is not just someone that knows stuff. Hey, like a wise Christian is not someone that can quote a Bible verse at you about everything. Jesus doesn't give us any room. These ancient writers don't give us any room to think that wisdom is just about the knowledge that you know. Wisdom is not about knowing stuff. It's about listening to the right stuff and doing it. He says that's what a wise person... A wise person is someone that listens to the right voices and then applies it and does it. That's what a wise person is. So walking in wisdom is literally walking in the Word of God. Both the revealed Word of God, what we have here in these pages, but also the, 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 the revealing Word of God as God speaks to you about the situations in your life and so on. As the Holy Spirit nudges you, gives you peace, pushes you this way, that way, helps you get understanding and so on. There's the revealed word of God. Then there's the revealing word of God where the Spirit of God is speaking to you about those personal things and that other stuff that's going on inside of your life. But here's what wisdom is. Wisdom is walking in the word of God. That's literally what wisdom is. It's literally walking in the word of God. Proverbs 2.6 says, For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. There's a connection there between what God is saying and you receiving wisdom. Wisdom is walking in the word of God. That's what wisdom is. He goes on further in Proverbs 13.10. Where there is strife, there's pride, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. Isn't that interesting? Wisdom is found in the person who's taking the advice. We think wisdom is the person speaking. He's saying, no, no, a really wise person understands. They don't know everything. A real wise person understands that, 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 that there's more to know. A real wise person understands that there's, there's, there's always something else to learn, another perspective to see, another perspective to hear, and we know that perspective comes from God. Sometimes God will use people. I've got no problem with that. But the point is what these people are going to be speaking to us is going to be the word of God. It's, it's coming from either the spirit and what we know uh, the, the, the character and the nature of the Father is, or maybe it'll come through a prophetic utterance or something like that that somebody feels the Lord's speaking to us. But the point is that wisdom here is not ascribed to the person that's saying the advice. Here, the, the wise person is the one that's listening. Isn't that amazing? You want to be wise? You don't have to be the smartest person. Be a listener. Be open to receiving from God what he wants to say to you. That's a wise person. That's what wisdom is. Proverbs 19, 20. Listen to advice and accept discipline, and at the end you'll be counted among the wise. Listen. Again, there's going to be some stuff coming your way. Listen to the right stuff and apply it, and you will be wise. Wisdom is not about the information that you have in your head. Wisdom is about listening to the right stuff and then applying it. Put those two things together and all of a sudden you become a wise person. Wouldn't it be great in 2023 if we all made the decision that we were going to ask God for wisdom, believe that God would give us wisdom, and we were going to make 2023 a year of living in wisdom instead of a year of constantly crying out for miracles. I will have. Here's the thing. You are going to have many opportunities this year where you need miracles. Whether you make good choices or bad choices, things are going to happen this year where you're going to need to cry out to God for a miracle. And we will stand with you and believe with you that God will come through and that you'll receive that miracle. That's what we do as a community. It's what we do as a family. It's what we do as a body. We will believe together. But don't make your goal to have a whole year where you need miracles. Use wisdom and you might eliminate the number of miracles that you need. And because miracles are not a guarantee, I'd like to eliminate the number of miracles that I need by making wise relational choices, by making healthy choices with eating, by exercising, keeping my body in good shape, by making wise decisions financially so I'm not crying out. These are the things that I can do, but I can't do them just with my own understanding. I, I, I want to take what James said, and I want to start going to God and going, God, I need wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing. It's what I need, God. Would you give me wisdom so that 2023 can be all 
all that it's meant to be. I can become the person I'm meant to be. At the end of 2023, I don't want to stand there and look back and go, I'm the same person I was 365 days ago because I didn't have any perseverance, because I didn't seek wisdom, because I didn't cry out for wisdom, because I didn't ask for wisdom. You know, when Jesus... I'll get the band back. You guys want to come back? I want to finish with that song, Goodness of God. You know, when Jesus... We've all, we've all heard this, right? Jesus in Luke 4, when Jesus is tempted in the garden, uh, uh, tempted by the devil. You all know that story? You want to know that story in Luke 4? Yeah. 40 days, 40 nights, no food. He's hungry. And we get these snippets of what went on there. And, and it says that he was tempted by the devil. And each time he was tempted, he spoke the word of God, right? Now, here's, here's the way I've always heard that presented, is that, that, that Jesus quoted scripture. At the devil. And, and you know what? That's true. There's an element of truth in that. But I was reading it this week and something struck me a little bit different. I, Jesus wasn't just quoting scripture. Let me tell you something. There are people, you, you can, if, if you're not living it and you're just throwing the words around, scripture is not, this is not a book of magic spells. This is not Harry Potter's magic spell book. If I just find the right passage and throw it out there and I'll just, you know, and, and look, let's be real. We had that going through the church numbers of years back where people would just let's pluck out whatever we want and throw it to God and we, 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 we put demands on God and he has to honour his word and so on woohoo hang on a second he is still God <laughs> he is still God the creator of the universe and I am still submissive to him I don't ever want to feel like I'm God and I point fingers at him and I begin demanding of him and telling him what he should and shouldn't do as a matter of fact if you find yourself demanding of God my suggestion is go back to the basics you don't have faith when I go to a restaurant and I place an order for my chicken curry and the waitress walks off, I sit back, return to my conversation because I have full faith and trust that that person is going to bring me the chicken curry because that's, it, it's appropriate, it's what I asked for, it's right, it's going to come. The minute I turn around and start abusing that waitress, where's my chicken? It's because I've lost faith that she's going to bring it. So I don't need to do that. And I don't need to do that with God either. But here's the thing that struck me this week. Jesus wasn't just quoting scripture at the devil. It is written, it is written, it is written. He wasn't just quoting scripture at the enemy. Jesus was explaining to the devil his actions. In other words, he was living it in the very presence of the enemy and educating the devil going, you don't get this, do you? The devil says, turn these stones into bread. Jesus says this, he says, you can see that I'm not turning the stones into bread. And here's why. Men shall not live on bread alone. Dummy. He wasn't just quoting scripture. He was explaining what he was living in the face of the devil in that moment. Can you see I'm not worshipping you? Here's why. Worship the Lord your God only. Can you see I'm not throwing myself off the edge of this cliff? Here's why. Don't put the Lord your God to the test. I don't need to. He wasn't just throwing stuff out there and quoting scripture. He was living. He was explaining to the devil what he was living. And this is what I love about Jesus. He lived it. Therefore, when he spoke it, there was power and authority. He lived it. He lived it. And Jesus was very, very wise because he listened to the right stuff and he did it. It's not complicated, is it? It's very, very simple. He listened to the right stuff and he acted on the right stuff. If you want to be wise in 2023, you've got to start listening to the right stuff and acting on the right stuff. And you can have all the resolutions in the world if you don't have the wisdom to get the perseverance to sustain and make the changes and go on and do them, then you're going to end up right back where you are. My, 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 my prayer this year for me is I want wisdom this year. I've, you know, I've never started a year with a New Year's resolution of God, I want wisdom. Yet it's been right there as plain as the nose on my face. If anyone lacks wisdom, ask. I look back over the last 12 months and go, God, I made some unwise decisions. I found myself in some situations where I didn't know what to do, so I just did what I thought was best, but never once did I stop and say, Lord, God, I need wisdom. And you've promised to give it to me, Father, so why am I not stopping? Why am I not asking you, God, give me wisdom? Who wants to be wise in 2023? Who wants to make 2023 the year of living wisely? I do. There's about four of you. That's awesome. We've got four of you on board. Are you prepared to listen to and act upon the right stuff?
Are you prepared to stop and actually ask God for wisdom and believe that your Father will give it to you? Then here's the thing. We're going to do what James has instructed us to do right now. So if that's you, here's what we're going to do. I want you to stand with me. You don't have to, no pressure. I want you to stand with me. We're going to start right now. We are going to ask God to give us wisdom. We're going to ask God to give us wisdom to be the the parents we need to be. We're going to ask God together to give us wisdom to be the business people we need to be, to be the husbands and the wives that we need to be, to be the, the disciples that we need to be in our community, to be the students we need to be. We're going to ask God right now. We're going to do this stuff. This is what James said. If anyone lacks wisdom, ask God. He gives generously to all without finding fault, but believe in your heart that he's going to do it. So we're going to right now, just for 30 seconds, we're just going to do what James said. We're not spectating here. We're participating in what the Holy Spirit's doing. And so for 30 seconds, I just want you to close your eyes, open your hands, get on your knees. I don't care what you do, but I want you just to speak to God and I want you to ask your Heavenly Father for wisdom and I want you to believe in Jesus' name. Let's do it. Father, we thank you this morning, Lord. We thank you, God, that wisdom is more precious than gold, Father. Lord, we thank you that this thing called wisdom that is more precious than gold, that, Lord, we've been told that if we need it, we can simply ask you and ask in faith and that you will give it to us, Lord. And so, Father, in this room right now, Lord, we need wisdom. And, Father, we're asking you for wisdom, God. Lord, we're asking you for wisdom to be the parents that we're meant to be. Wisdom to be the husbands and the wives that we're meant to be. Wisdom to be the bosses, the employers that we're meant to be. Wisdom to be the employees that we are meant to be. Lord, wisdom to to be the students that we're meant to be. Lord, wisdom to be the disciples that we're meant to be in an ever-changing culture that's pushing against anything to do with you. Father, we need wisdom in this place, God. And Father, we pray collectively together, God, as a church, as a family, and we pray for wisdom. We ask for wisdom, and we receive that wisdom in Jesus' name. We thank you for the promise, God, that if we ask, you will give it to us without finding fault. So we ask right now for wisdom for 2023. Lord, let this be a year that we look back on and go, you know what, I've never had a year where I made so few bad decisions because I actually included you. I included your word. I sought your face. And I did to the best of my knowledge what I thought was the right thing, what it was that I felt like you were saying to me, Father. I pray for each of us in this room that that would be our testimony at the end of 2023. Because, God, you truly are a good God. You truly are a good God. And we love you and we worship you and we thank you again for the opportunity to gather in this place this this morning, God. And we pray and we ask this together in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Amen.